Hello and welcome back to No Man's Sky everybody. This is Elon Paul. We're going to do another 101 video. Sorry it's been a little bit of time since my last one. We uh, have a little bit of a family vacation going on and some other personal things. But we're back and we're going to get right into it right away. Uh, we're going to keep the video kind of short so we can uh, keep this in segments. So this video is going to focus mainly on your pause menu. Um, I've already gone into the tab menu a little bit and described some of the areas that we can get into on there, but we'll go into that into more detail later. Right now, you're going to hit your escape button and get into your pause menu. The pause menu contains several categories. Um, on a run through when you're doing the expeditions, as you've been seeing a lot of videos from different uh, players in regards to that, there'll be an extra option up here. But for now, you'll have four categories. You'll have discoveries, cataloging guide, the log, and options. I'm going to start all the way over to the right. Now you can select it with your cursor or you can use as it shows up there the A and D to scroll around as you wish. Some are faster than others so it's just really personal preference at that point. So what are we looking at in the main pause menu? First thing you're going to notice is you it will always show who your character is. It shows you how many credits you have, how many nanites you have, and how much quicksilver you have. We've gone into detail in the last video into what, what those are in regards to units being your main form of currency in the game, nanites being the secondary and also a pretty important currency in the game, quicksilver is the third currency and even more rare, but it helps you to acquire things when you're in the anomaly, which we'll get to later. So again, we're going to start out in the menu system here showing the options. Options are just what you might think in any other game. Uh, you have your general options, video and graphics options, as well as network control and difficulty settings. You also obviously can pull up your last saves, as well as rename the current one that you have right now. And obviously you can exit the game either back to the mode select screen or straight out to your desktop whenever you wish. So you'll notice that it says last restore point, it has no data. The restore point usually occurs when you get in and out of your starship, or when you purposely go to a save point in other means. You can create two different types of devices that you can save things from, and there's also uh, devices within the planets or moons that you're on that you can walk up to and save your game. And we'll show you that at another time. You've probably seen them in many other videos besides and just didn't realize what you were seeing there. Uh, obviously renaming is just what you might think. You can rename this save and I'm just going to call this the 101 training save. And we'll just leave it there. Um, once we accept it, it gives us into a menu that allows us to change difficulty settings. Now, we described the difficulty settings earlier in the last video, so I'm not going to get into it right now. But you can change things on the fly if you wish, unless you purposely go down here and lock it out. So, since we haven't done that, we can go in here and change things if we wish. We're not going to do that for us. So either you can right-click here or hit your escape button one time to exit completely. For us, we're going to right-click, get back to the main menu. So let's discuss general options. General options include many different things. It has the audio selections in here. I have mine set very, very low. Otherwise, you're going to hear all this music. It's going to be extremely loud. You're not going to be able to make out anything I'm saying. I have the sound effects turned down quite a bit as well. So that way, you're still hearing the sound effects in the video. But again, it's not overwhelming. Uh, in the in here, you have your HUD. Dis uh, you have your basically your HUD display. If we can enable or disable that, if we wish. There are certain times when certain players, for instance, uh, I've seen Jason do a special type of run through where he turns off the HUD. So what is the HUD? Let's escape to get out of here real quick. So as you're looking around, um, if I pull this out and I get my mining beam, you notice the mining beam shows at the top right. We have the log at the bottom right telling us what we need to be doing. So let's go back into this menu. We're going to go back to general options and I'm going to turn off the HUD. You don't need to save anything. You can just escape your way back out. Notice nothing is showing now. I don't have anything. It doesn't tell me how my life support is doing or anything along those lines. Well, then how can I tell how I'm doing? Well, as far as your, your weapon is concerned, pardon me, your multi-tool is concerned, you can look at your multi-tool and see what the charge is just by going into the main menu. For life support, if you go to your exosuit again, you can tell what your life support is like and how your shield or hazard protection is doing. But you'll also notice if you look at this display of what your backpack looks like, you have a red side and you have a blue side. 
your red side is your or should be your hazard protection. The blue side is your health. So you notice it says 92% right now. The way you can tell that is it's not quite all the way to the top over here. You see there's a little gap. So obviously this is going to be your life support. The hazard protection is maxed out. So when you're running around, you can look at the back of your backpack and you can see how well you're doing just by looking at the blue or red rings on the back. So that's a bit another way you can tell what's going on. But this makes the game extremely difficult to follow. So up to you if you want to turn that off and give yourself a little bit more of a challenge. Damage numbers, same thing. It's basically enabling or disabling the damage numbers at the top left of your screen as we showed uh, when we were getting damage earlier when we jumped up in the air and then landed and we got hurt. Well, that's the damage numbers that it would show you at the top left. So we're not going to show that at this time. We're going to continue on. We'll leave that enabled. Hold to confirm is enabled right now. If we disable that, that is going to be for certain items that we can open, for instance, doors or something like that. So if we click here, we can select something and it will automatically put it in there rather than rotate around in a full circle to indicate that that's what we want. If you're doing things like speed runs or something along those lines, it might not be a bad idea to turn that on. Pardon me. To disable it, if you will. So the hold to confirm can be disabled and you can immediately click on things. How much time it will save you in a speed run, I have no idea. Um, possibly it could go a lot quicker or not as the case may be. But that's an interesting thought, and I wonder if anyone like Zane has ever troubled himself to figure that out. Temperature. Obviously, you can change back and forth between the different temperatures. You can go to Kelvin if you want. Believe it or not, it actually has the Kelvin scale on here for absolute zero on up. Or you can go to Celsius or Fahrenheit. First person head bob is enabled. In other words, if you're in the first person mode as you're, as you're running through the landscape, it can do the bob. Now, what is this related to? Think about Minecraft. I'm sure a lot of you have played Minecraft in the past. And if you're in that first person mode while you're running through, if you turn the bob on, you literally are bouncing from side to side as you're running through areas. This is the same as that. I seem, weirdly enough, I seem to have it enabled here, and I like it in No Man's Sky, and yet I hate it in Minecraft for some reason. I don't know why. Very odd. Auto torch. Auto torch is, think of it from like a light sensor point of view. There's a sensor built into your suit that as nightfall comes on, your torch automatically comes on. Or if you walk into a dark environment, like walk into a building that's dark or walk into a cave, your torch will automatically turn on, basically your flashlight. You can disable that. I prefer to have it disabled. It is completely up to you if you want to or not. You can disable it and then, like me, use your T button to open and turn it on and turn it off at, at whim. Galaxy Map Color Filter is defaulted. Uh, I don't mess with this. This basically means that when you pull out into the map, it goes to a default color scheme when you're going into the galaxy mode to warp across the galaxy. So it gives you that color filters. Leave it alone. I suggest just don't mess with this. And the flash to white transitions are enabled. If you're photosensitive, if you're subject to the possibility of seizures, you may want to go ahead and disable this feature. Um, just something to help protect you at that point. Obviously, you can view credits here as well. So these are some of the main features here. Scrolling up and down does nothing. These are the only things in the general options area. You notice it says you can hit escape to return, or you can just right click. Now, video options. This has a lot to do with your video card and what you're using. You'll see that I'm not using an RTX card at this time. I'm using a GTX 1650 Super. It seems to be working pretty well for me. I haven't had any problems or any crashes. Lower end cards tend to seem to have a little bit of trouble with certain graphics and can lock up on you. Just a heads up, fair warning. You may have to turn some of your graphics down in order to play this game or else you could be locking up frequently. Um, you can do it full screen mode, windowed mode, bordered mode, borderless, however you want to do it. Uh, what monitor you're using, the resolution of said monitor, the resolution scaling as far as how you want to look at it, whether it's going to be triple buffered. A lot of you who have video cards already understand a lot of these features in regards to how you want to uh, perform the graphics quality on your game. Uh, so I'm not going to go into too much detail about how much you want to do this with. Uh, for those of you who have really nice monitors that, can, that are running at 100 and, say 140 megahertz, by all means crank it up. 
uh, your on foot field of view and your flight field of view. I have mine set up to maximum at 100 right now. Um, it seems to help me a great bit in being able to find things. So I keep that up. I don't like the motion blur, so I keep it turned off. Again, the scan lines and stuff, I don't mind that. That's just that little uh, uh, broadcast scan when you scan uh, across the area to see what elements are around you, like carbon, oxygen, things like that. That's just giving you the effect, if you will. It's a special effect. That's a good way of looking at it. And finally, your HUD scale. You can increase or decrease the scale of the HUD and make things either larger or smaller in the, in the display. Again, scrolling up and down, there's no other options here. If you apply, if you change, made a change and apply something, there are occasions when it will tell you that you're going to have to reset the game in order to get those options applied. Now those deal with just general video options. You also have a graphics options that has other settings. This looks similar to the save menu that we were talking about earlier or that you saw earlier. So let me just make an adjustment here real quick. There we go. Okay. That's something cut off my screen I needed to see. So you'll see that a lot of mine are set to enhance and standard and a couple things are set to high. Now there is some videos out there I can't advertise them at this time but if you do a search on YouTube there are videos out there that will help you to enhance your PC in order to play No Man's Sky or similar games it allows you to dedicate all of its resources to the game that you're playing this has helped me greatly I've noticed that when I've watched my my video card which only has about four gigs of video RAM on it um, my video RAM usage dropped from about 90-95% all the way down to 75%. So it's been running at a much more efficient way by using all those features that they did. And they actually go into the settings of No Man's Sky and tell you what you should adjust. So that's what I've been doing here. Um, so these settings are set to my computer. Shadow quality, post-processing, terrain, tessellation. Really, I don't think there's much of a difference. Now, if I'm running an RTX card, say a 3060, or maybe some of the newer 4000 series, I'm sure I could get to Ultra and it wouldn't have any problems. And then, obviously, you have your other settings down here. A lot of you will understand these settings a lot better for your video cards. If you don't understand these settings for your video cards, me explaining it to you is not going to make any sense. It's usually a good idea to go through some tutorials online regarding your own video card in order to understand those settings better. Coming back to this, network settings. This is important. You'll notice that there's group settings over here, looking at your friends list and things like that. In the network, you can have multiplayer on or off, disabled or enabled. This allows you to see other players, players who are playing within your area, if you will. When you go to the anomaly and you land on the anomaly, you'll see many other players there that are playing if this is enabled. It also uses up more video because uh, your video RAM is going to be used because it's also trying to draw out what they're doing and keeping an eye on them. So you'll notice that your VRAM usage is going to increase because of that. If you're playing a game that you're trying to just do your own thing, not a bad idea to turn multiplayer off. It kind of gives you the single player option, allows you to play the game with, with better efficiency. But while you'll notice in here, this also allowing PVP I suggest turning that off and unless you like the PvP options there's a lot of people who for instance will do a permadeath run through I've described permadeath in my last game uh, in the last video that we did and describe what that was like if you die you have to start over again if this feature is on someone can literally if you have multiplayer turned on and PvP on they can strafe the planet with one of their ships shooting down at you, take you out, you have to restart your whole game. Sometimes you run across people that will do that. There's not a lot of nasty players out there. To be honest, I think I've seen it happen more often amongst friends who are playing together to do it as a joke. So probably want to turn that off. Now in regards to bases and stuff like that, obviously you can add a base. Um, personally, can add base parts. I allow anybody to put any parts on my base if they wish. But it can become a problem. What if someone decided to just spam and just started throwing tons and tons of stuff on your base? That could cause you problems. So you can change this to anything you want. No one, friends only, groups and friends, anyone. 
I usually have it as friends only. Delete paste parts, I don't like to have anybody really deleting any of my base parts. Do you want to show your ship marker? Well, when you're playing in multiplayer, you can sometimes don't you can sometimes don't mind people seeing where your ship is. But if you really want to keep it kind of private, you can turn that off. I usually leave it on because basically, like I said, the No Man's Sky community tends to be a very friendly community. I don't mind people seeing me. Uh, can edit base terrain. Same thing around the base. Groups and friends. I usually have this set to friends only. Speech to text enable. Translate text. That's handy if you have a nice headset or microphone set up for you where you can speak while you're in chat mode and it will tr it'll automatically uh, translate it out for you. It doesn't work perfectly, just like any other program, but it is kind of a handy thing to have when your hands are occupied. So this gives you a rundown of what all these are here. So you can still do the voice chat and the text chat if you wish. I have mine enabled at the moment. I don't use it all the time. While you're in multiplayer mode, you can then also go into your View No Man's Sky friends list and see what friends are currently playing. You notice I have Jason in here as well, along with a fellow by the name of Captain Richard, some of you might know him, and a couple of my other friends. So these are their friend codes. You can have them from Steam or No Man's Sky directly. Completely up to you. And you can show your own No Man's Sky friend code. That happens to be mine. And I've shared that many times, and I don't have any problem with anybody being my friend in the game. So, and then you can add your friend code at the bottom for other people. Let me just go back to that for a second. I kind of jumped out of that real quick. You can add a No Man's Sky friend if somebody gave you their friend code. You can put them in here. Okay. Uh, let's see. You can view your block players. I don't have any. There's nothing to do there. Occasionally someone may group with you by accident. You may be going through the anomaly Someone accidentally is trying to click on something else, and they accidentally click on you when you go past, and it offers them the offers you or them an invite to join a group. And if you accidentally select yes because you weren't paying attention, you can go here and leave the group. You can also view any nearby players that are near you as well. Okay, that's the network options. So again, network again recommendation when you're doing things or you're looking for special stuff, you want to play by yourself, disable it when you get a chance. Control options are, as, as you might think, um, your sensitivity for your mouse uh, as far as uh, look and flight. Look has to do with when you're wandering around on the ground. Flight, obviously, is with your ship and how smooth things are. I have mine set to most of the general stuff that are in here. Uh, view controls, flight controls, these are all personal preference as far as, the, as, far as everything's concerned, uh, including camera height. Uh, let me see here. It will hold Starship Combat Auto Follow is up to you. There's a special feature that when you're fighting in your Starship, you can hold down the S button when you're in combat, and your ship will auto follow to the next or closest combatant. And it will automatically follow just by holding it down. You may not, may not go any faster, you may not speed up, but it will allow you to keep track of where that ship is located at. Um, you can have that enabled or not. is up to you. Um, whoops. High level. There we go. So you can toggle it by tapping it. You can disable it completely, or you can enable and hold it. So basically you have to hold the S button down the whole time. I have it set up that way. I'm going to keep it that way. Worry about it another time. I might try different features later on. Finally, you got your difficulty settings, and you remember this from our first video. So you can come back in here and do difficulty settings if you didn't lock them. Okay, so this covers the options menu and all your different selections in here. Your log is your current missions. So this is what your primary missions are, and you can have up to three of them. In the regular gameplay, if you go by the storyline, like we've been advising all along, this is where you'll find the main missions, and they'll always come up with three different main missions. Always. Right now we have one. You can have a maximum of three. There'll never be more than three. Your secondary missions may involve smaller things, like if you acquire a piece of technology from a find on a planet, it may pop up as a secondary mission to automatically allow you to, to uh, follow through on that installation. You can go ahead and select it, and sometimes it'll have a selection down here that says unpin this particular thing, and you can unpin it, and that way it'll just delete that mission from you. But not all of them will do this, because this is a very important mission right now. So that's what the log shows. Current mission, 
gives you details on the missions and what you need to be doing. So if your current mission says your objectives are to test and repair multi-tool systems, but doesn't give you a whole lot of information, look at your secondary missions and you're most likely going to find something related to it. And then it gives you a very detailed explanation of how you can go about fixing what it's telling you to fix. We'll come back to that in a moment. Describing the catalog and guide. Your guide describes factions and reputations in regards to different things. It will actually give you categories and gives you survival basics, how to get around, making discoveries. Is it sounding kind of familiar, like maybe some of the things I'm talking about right now? But if you didn't know it existed here, you wouldn't have known where to find it. So now you know. It does give good details on how to go about taking care of things, how you can learn uh, the alien life forms and their 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 languages, uh, how to make money, uh, construction options. But you know what? There's a lot better videos out there that'll tell you a lot better details on how to do all of these things. So hopefully this is considered one of them. You never know. Uh, so besides the guide, you have journey milestones of certain different things that you might want to do. Like for instance, if I want to see what I can do about making the Viking more important, uh, make myself more important to the Viking. I can select these different options in order to figure out what I need to do. Same thing with the Gek, the Corvax, the Merchant's Guild, the Mercenary's Guild, the Explorer's Guild. There's, there's guilds, there's life forms, and then you have exploration milestones and survival milestones. So as you are on foot and walking around and you get to 8,000 steps walked, it'll go up to the very first on-foot exploration and you'll get the first category of achievement for that. There are up to 10 achievements for each one of these categories. Same thing with the exploration milestones and having to deal with other types of things like planetary zoology. If I find all of the animals on one planet, I get a special bonus and it gives me a plus one to my uh, planetary zoology achievement. So there's lots of milestones you can achieve here and this is a good way to track it. I wouldn't worry about this too much from a, from a new person's point of view of playing the game. You'll acquire these things as you go. You're going to be excited that you're going to get these achievements, and then later on, you can look into how you can look into how to maximize these achievements. Uh, same thing on these on ships destroyed, Apollo, and then you get into these areas, the catalog itself. So materials and items. Just to touch on that real quick, anything that you scan or you find, it lists them here. And if you're saying, for instance, I would like to find some cobalt. If I select cobalt like this, it tells me also the value of what it's worth. And I go back to my log, I will get a secondary mission saying, hey, would you like to find this? Let's go back to that for a second. Yep, it's not going to let me do it right now because we're too early on in the storyline. So you can select it and you can find those items. So you have these core items, which are carbon, oxygen, dihydrogen, etc. And a lot of these are actual minerals that we're used to. Some are made up. Uh, so you'll learn these things. You have the exotic items. You'll see that these are like copper, cadmium, emerald, indium, activated copper, etc. Lots of other different types of items that you can look for. And again, you can select them if you want to find them and it tells you what they're used for, used for upgrading, what they're valued at. It's pretty neat stuff. Fuel and utilities, it gives you all these things and you'll notice that as you get, point, get past a certain point you'll have to go to the second screen in order to find more. And you will get an understanding of what each one of these are not only worth but what they're used for. Starship launch fuel, I think you can pretty much figure out what that's for. An ion battery, what do you use ion batteries for? Well it says it's used for building, charging, and upgrading. Hmm, you'll learn later on what to use them for. But it tells you in order to build one, your required parts are cobalt and ferrite dust. If I acquire each one of those, I can make one of these. And it's given me a check mark next to both, which means I have enough of these items in order to make myself an ion battery. So I'll show you how that's done in just a moment. But it also gives you the recipes for creating things. It tells me I can use this for crafting and upgrading, but... I don't actually make one of these, but it's a technology that I can acquire by going to a space station or to a trader. I can get, I can get these things. Carbon nanotubes tells me its value is 500. It's used for building, crafting, and upgrading. But this is something that we can actually create because its required parts says carbon. You know, if this one doesn't have any required parts, this one does. That means we can build this on our own, and we know the recipe. 
So while we can build this on our own, we don't have the components to build it, and we don't have the recipe, hence the reason why it's grayed out. So we can't build certain components that we've never learned yet. But it tells us what we need to build them later on. How do you learn them? You learn them from many different sources. You can either find a recipe on the planet that you're exploring. You may find it in the anomaly. Uh, inside the anomaly, there is a special desk in there that you can actually acquire the recipes from by spending nanites on them. And that's how you acquire those. You have exotic goods that you can acquire in your travels. Uh, I won't get into what each one of these are. I think you should probably find out on your own what they're for and where you can find them. But some of these are worth quite a bit. 70000 for that unit of loan. 211000 for one of those. So acquiring these can be quite expensive and be very much worth your time. Curiosities are the same thing. These are items that you can get from space stations or from discovering on planets. Trade goods are things that you can sell or pick up in trade terminals and sell elsewhere for a, pro for a profit. I've never actually gone through and done that where I picked up something from somewhere and sold it someplace else. I didn't see much profit in doing so because uh, you'd have to know the economy of every system around you and really the time taken to do so would be astronomical. Uh, so it's really not worth going into that, at least in my humble opinion. Plants are things that you can either find on planet or you can grow on your own. Most of these you can find on a planet and they help you out. And some of them you can grow on your own or acquire from traders. Raw berries for the most part are found just about anywhere. And some of these are found on planets that can actually help you in some way. Notice it says you can uh, process in a nutrient processor to generate edible products. Well, you can eat them on their own and they usually provide you with some sort of benefit on the planet that you're on. Finally, cooking. Yes, cooking. You can use a nutrient processor, which looks like a little barbecue grill, more like a uh, George Foreman grill, to be honest with you. I don't know how else to describe it. It's like a glass window on the front. Very odd looking thing. Anyway, you can cook certain things and turn them into meals. And a lot of these are obviously disgusting, but you'll notice that there's a one heck of a menu structure down here to get into certain things. Baked eggs, steamed vegetables, some of these you're not going to know yet, obviously. you got jam, dough, mystery meat stew, stewed organs. Oh, that just sounds yummy, doesn't it? Flavor some sauce. You actually have an esophageal surprise, which is kind of like a cake, I suppose. Horrifying mush. Oh, that just sounds, yeah, horrifying. Uh, unsolvable jam turnover. I haven't seen that one before. That's great. And they have cakes and stuff like that. And you can learn a lot of these things over time. So that takes care of your catalog of things that you can look for. So keep in mind, when you want to build a device and it needs an element that you've never seen before, try looking for it. One of the most common ones that you need to look for is basalt. But it tells you it's typically found on planets with a volcanic environment. Very interesting. Keep that in the back of your mind. So we're on to the last menu item on here, which is discoveries. These are the places that you've been to. This is normally where you start, and it shows you what planet you're on. It shows you where on the planet you are. That's very handy to know. So if you're wondering where on a planet you're located at, you can actually find that out and find out what there is about the planet. It can tell you everything about the system you're in, and it can tell you about trading, uh, what the conflict level currently is, and which the dominant life form is that's here. Uh, right now, I've discovered one planet, and it tells me the discoveries of this planet what the flora is, the fauna, and minerals. Now it tells me that there's six different animals on here that I can discover. And then it discovers minerals and things like that. These are waypoints that you discover along the way and it shows you a picture of each one as you discover them. Waypoints are a special type of device in the ground that you can come across that you can also save your game. It gives you details about the planet, what kind of weather it has, whether the sentinels are there, ever present, what kind of flora, Abundant, fauna, common, which means it isn't a lot, but we got some. And then what the main resources are. So fungal mold is what's common on here as far as the main plant. That's useful for certain recipes. And then the three biggest resources you can find as far as elements are concerned. In this, in this case, magnetized ferrite. Eh, it's okay. Ammonia, eh, also handy. But copper is more important. It's one of your basic building blocks that you're going to need. Keep that in your mind. 
Now, another thing we can do, you'll notice that it says here that Obabield M7 was discovered one week ago by me. That means no one else has seen this planet before. What's the significance of that? Well, if you discover a new planet, you're given the option to rename it. So I can put a new name in here, and I'm going to call this Planet on Paul. Yeah, no, a bit self-gratuitous, but enjoy it. I accept that, and now it is a new planet. The discovery is uploaded, and I get automatically 10 nanites as a bonus. Pretty cool, huh? So, as I said on my last one, you notice it says online discovery service is active, so it's actually going online and uploading my discovery. Now, if someone comes across this planet a couple months from now and they start out here, they're going to be on planet Alon Paul. There we go. You'll see it, and I can also rename the system as well if I want. And any system you go to that you hop and skip and jump to will show up on here, and you'll be able to select the system, and it'll show you what planets you've been on. So you notice that we have one, two, three other planets that are unknown, and two moons as well. So this is an interesting system. I like this. All right, so that's our discoveries, and that takes care of our main menu. Like I said, there'll be one more option up here under the... Uh, when we have cer certain types of events going on, um, and they will show up in this menu as well. So for the expeditions, for instance, you'll get a special item in here that says expeditions. You can go there and select it. Watch some of my expedition videos, and you'll understand what that's about. So our main skill here, and this thing I said I was going to do on the last video, is we're going to repair this scanner. Now to do so, it tells me I need to gather ferrite dust for repair. So if I hit my tab button and look at my main menu here, you see that it is damaged and requires 75 ferrite dust. In here, I have ferrite dust. I've gathered 86. I've got a little bit of carbon. I've got some condensed carbon I found as well. And I've got some sodium in case I ever need to add anything to my hazard protection. But I also found cobalt. Now you recall earlier that when I said, and oh, by the way, if you get come across geodes, it has an E in here that says analyze, and what that does is it allows us to break down the element, this geode, into whatever element it was it came from. So either it's going to be cobalt or the ferrite dust. Looks like it was cobalt. Very good. That allows us to add it to here. So remember we, we had discovered what the ion battery was about? Well, if you left click on any one of these blanks, it'll give you a product menu of things that you can build based on what you have in, in your cargo space. Right now, I want to produce an ion battery, which means needs 10 cobalt and 5 ferrite dust. I'm just going to do one because I need the rest of this right now. And there you go. And it tells you it created that. You'll also be able to create things such as your life support shell. This fuels your life meter completely up to 100% as it's getting low. I need dihydrogen jelly, and I require carbon. So dihydrogen is an element that we can find out there. You can also create things such as metal plates. The jelly that we were just talking about, you can make a Starship launch fuel if you have the right, the right devices, requiring a metal plate and dihydrogen. You see that? It gives you everything you need to know about how you need to build something, including warp cells. But I can't create anything else. These are the first eight things I am uh, permitted to create. If you left click on one of your menu items here, it tells you what, all the technolo what other technologies you can build here. So that takes care of this area here. Let's go ahead and get that thing fixed. So we have 81 ferrite, and it says I needed 75 to fix it. So we're going to hit the left button like it says for repair, and then left one more time. And, and it kicks me out and tells me it's repaired and plays some special music to tell me how wonderful that is. Very good. Okay, so what is our scanner going to do for us? Okay, so we're in the game menu right now and it's telling us that we can look for stuff and it's telling us that our ship is in this general direction right about there and if you get your center you see in the center of my screen I had that white dot if I get that on the icon it tells me how far away it is about 460 units away now if I hit the F button on my keyboard it tells me that I don't have an analysis visor so I can't really look around but if I hit the C button on my keyboard for my scanner that I just fixed it tells me what elements are around me. I've got some sodium over there, not too far away. I've got a deuterium-rich plant, which helps my jet pack. I've got some oxygen I can gather. And look, I've got some dihydrogen straight above me over here. 
So these are the main elements you're going to find on the surface. It doesn't tell me that there's cobalt in here because these are rocks that we're pulling it out of. So we'll worry about that another time. Let's add the one more thing in here so I can show you how that's done too. And that is going to be our analysis visor. We can add a bolt caster. We can add a shield. Bolt caster comes in handy later. But for now, let's get the analysis visor. In order to build it, it tells me I need one carbon nanotube, which we can make ourselves. So if we go over here and we want to create a carbon nanotube, it tells me we need 50 carbon. I have 64. So we'll create one. If we wanted to create more, you put your cursor over it. And you just go around in circles and you would create more. I don't have enough carbon and it's telling you I don't have enough. So now we have our carbon nanotube. And we have installed it. What does this analysis advisor do? If I hold the up down the F button, it allows me to look through a special visor to discover things. One thing it shows me is that, for instance, this rock I was getting my car, uh, cobalt from, it tells me that there's not only the primary element, which is cobalt, but there's a secondary element there. So how do we get that? Well, if I can, if I hold my left mouse button down while looking at this, it scans it. And it tells me that I can get cobalt and dihydrogen from it. So now I can get a second element. You notice it got filled in. So let's go ahead and grab it. And it's going to give me my carbon, uh, cobalt first. And a geode out of it as well. And then tells me how much dihydrogen I got out of it. Ooh, I got four dihydrogen. How very nice. And if I go back to the exosuit, let's process the geode. And we got ionized cobalt out of it this time, as well as my dihydrogen that we had from before. So that's what we get from that. It also allows us to look at these red dots. Well, what are those red dots? Red dots are creatures, animals. They indicate that those are creatures that I have not actually discovered yet, and that's why they're red. So if I look at one of them, it tells me it's a biological entity. And if I hold the scanner down, I have now discovered a new creature. And it gave me 1,600 credits for discovering it. There's another one over here. Let's discover that one. Okay. So that's two creatures discovered. Now, I don't see any other red, any other red dots here. Do we? So we discovered two out of the six creatures on the planet. I'll take a quick look around. I don't see any others. Always look to the sky because sometimes there's some flying creatures. Oh, there is one. Now, I can't quite get it just right sometimes. So if I hit the right mouse button, I can zoom in and zoom in a second time. And you don't have to stay on them to discover them. Once you get it going, you can you don't have to follow them anymore. If you jump back out of your visor and jump back in, it defaults back to the main screen. The main zoom, if you will. So if I do right click, right click, and then do one more, it pulls me back out. Finally, if you look at certain plants, they're doing the same thing. You see how it says primary element? If it only has the primary element, it's, unless you want to get some money, it's not really worth looking at it. But some of these have a secondary element. So if we look at it, this will give us carbon and condensed carbon. That's not handy. There's another one. Condensed carbon again. How handy. All right, so that's good to know. So I've got three. Oh, but there's another animal there. Look at him, huh? That's a fourth animal we've found now. So, do we get anything for discovering animals? We do. So if we go to our discoveries, four of six have been discovered. And what does it tell us? It tells us what these four are, but it tells us that there's also a ground animal that we haven't discovered yet, and an underground one in one of the caves. So let's jump back all the way out, take a look. I don't see any in the underground cave or could be anywhere nearby. Some of the underground animals will also hang out just around the edge of the cave. But again, I'm not seeing any. So that gives us a rough idea. What are some of these other icons here? I've gone into it in some of my videos, but you'll discover other things like buried technology that you can dig out. Um, ammonia deposit, as we know this has ammonia on this planet. Uh, it also tells us of pulpy roots, which are right there. And look, at, there's our starship. As well as other cargo drops that things that we can acquire along the way. It tells us what hazardous plants might be around that could injure us, as well as knowledge stones and other devices around the area. 
I'm just going to do one last thing. I'm going to go after this plant right here. So I have to hold my E button down for, while I'm scanning. Just tap it and it will put a marker down. Tap it again and it removes the marker. But if I highlight a certain item and hold E to tag it, it will highlight it so I can still see it even though my visor's off. So I'm going to go after this plant just to show you real quick what those do as I alluded to. practiced running you'll get used to it in the future so remember what I said about these plants so I get nine pulpy roots so what is that doing for me if I hold my cursor over it tells me it gives me 10% hazard protection for every one of those that I eat and if you look at the top left you notice my hazard protection is dropping it's down to 74% and then if you look at my backpack on the right hand side you'll see that the red line is going down see it on the backpack right there the red line is going down so that's how you tell how that works so what if we want to bring it back up we consume one of these 82 92 now I'm maxed out again and it tells me that the toxicity levels have recovered here's those the hydrogen crystals I was talking about gather them up I'm just going to gather them real quick. You notice my mining beam is getting hotter. And there we go. That should be all of them. Oh, missed one. Are there any more animals around? It's always good to scan for animals. It looks like we have one right there. And I can't quite see them behind the plants. So if I kindly move from side to side while I'm standing here. Looks like it's a bigger bigger creature alright let's take a walk over shall we and miss, visit the neighbors most animals will not attack some will and this early in the game you don't have to worry about it so we're looking at this one animal here we're going to scan him and that's animal number 5 we only have one animal left that we haven't discovered and if we do discover the 6th animal we'll get a nice sweet nanite bonus but I doubt we're going to find it. Oh, there's an unknown building. Those are handy when you're doing on when you're going on runs. If it's an unknown building, it's a good idea to find it. So let's head over to the ship, and we'll end the video there. I hope the menu system is a little bit more understandable now as far as adjustments you can make and do. I already found that creature. Okay, just checking. So we can run. We can walk. And oh, here's the oxygen plants. See? O2. Oxygen is obviously handy for any character because it provides you with life support. And it tells you that and now it has a new entry in our discoveries area that we can get that from. Here's one of those hazardous plants I was talking about. What they do is they swell up and they put out poison. But you notice these little pustules on either side? Don't stay too close or else you can get hurt. But I get a lot of oxygen from those little gassy pods. But what about the plant itself? It gives us more oxygen too. So it's a good idea to take those out, especially early game. Uh, looks like this is leading me right over here. So let's take a look. And ladies and gentlemen, there's our starter ship. And you notice it's damaged, and we'll go into a little more basics about the ship later and how we can fix it and repair it. And we'll go into a couple more different items as we scan around and the different elements that you might find. But I think this was a good run on this tutorial. I hope you enjoyed it. And we'll come back in the next episode and discover what our next thing is going to be. So thank you very much for watching. And if you would like to leave some messages or in the comments section, I really appreciate it. But for now... Let's wave goodbye, and thank you again for watching.